This is with the order for confession and forgiveness. <clears throat> oh, it's this one. Oh, uh, yeah. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts, through faith. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to use a piece of setting 10, and then I'm kind of bouncing around. I pick things, I kind of cherry pick things, that's an old Michigan saying, um, to use during this service. So we'll begin with that Curiate from setting 10, which is actually a hymn too. the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Now we continue with another curie, um, which comes out prayer of... Prayer of the day. Oh, I'm sorry, prayer of the day. That's right, and I do have it printed so I can read from here. Let us pray. O oh God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination. Where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring wings and strengthened dreams. 
All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And this next Kyrie, I believe you already know.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Our Gospel readings for our Lenten services are taken from the um, calendar of readings uh, for the church here. There actually are readings for every single day. And so on Wednesdays, I'm drawing the Gospel readings uh, from that calendar. Let's see. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Every day he was teaching in the temple, and at night he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives, as it was called. And all the people would get up early in the morning to listen to him in the temple. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them when no crowd was present. The Holy Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The first thing we need to acknowledge to ourselves and constantly remember in, in what is becoming a very difficult time in the world is that we are surrounded by God's grace every moment of every day and throughout every night. God's grace is never withdrawn, no matter how we might respond, though it happens sometimes, like it did with Judas, that people reject, reject that present grace that surrounds them and instead become participants, sometimes fully, sometimes only partially, uh, in the evil of the world. I never thought we'd face this again. I really thought that perhaps from my time, the Vietnam War might finish these kinds of things for us as a nation. And then we had the Iraq War and the Afghan War, all in attempts to stabilize some pretty unstable places in the world. And I have to admit, probably also to get a hold of the natural resources that were there. Um, today, we'd certainly love to have greater access to the oil resources of the Middle East and, and kind of be in control of them. But the reality is, we don't always, we don't always go to military action for the right reasons as a nation. Sometimes it's for the benefit of the nation economically, sometimes it's for the benefit of democracy in the world. Uh, sometimes it's hard to understand why we do it at all. So I start most mornings by turning on national news at home. And the portrayal, not just the portrayal, but the reality of the people in the Ukraine right now is pretty amazing. It's an extraordinary dark, extraordinarily dark time for them. And it is a, a certain and sure sign for each of us in this season of Lent about how quickly the world can take away things that we take for granted the things that we call blessings from God 
our homes, our businesses, our communities, can all go away in a big hurry because there is enough brokenness and sin in the world so that sometimes one nation upon nation will seek to gather and gain control. Sometimes it happens between people. This morning, this morning on the news, on the radio, driving the boys to school, they were talking about road rage in the community and how to avoid getting encountered by it. It tells us about a time every day when we're out on the streets driving when we really need to understand that God is present with us and that we only can do the best job we can do in the driving we do. We may make a mistake that may really frost somebody and they may become very, very angry with us. It's especially true for those of us who are seniors, um, with the exception of Debbie. She's, she has a birthday tomorrow, by the way, so remember to wish her happy birthday. Um, you know, for those of us who are seniors, those mistakes on the road come naturally. <laughs> they just happen, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I now have six sets of eyes in my van when I drive around town telling me when things need to change from what I'm seeing. Um, but the reality is that that sin and brokenness in the world is all around us even when we are traveling with our spouses or partners or our children or our friends and family. We are faced with it all of the time. And you and I really need to rely on God's grace uh, every time we step even when we're living in our homes, but every time we step out. Um, I suppose it's wrong for me to pray for the Phoenix Suns, huh? Um, I've been catching their games, and pretty soon they'll go to the... I don't know who anybody else watches here, but I've enjoyed watching the Suns this year. First time I've watched basketball in my life uh, this year. Um, but that's a whole different segue. I suppose you could call the opposing teams evil, but that really wouldn't be fair, would it? Um, you know, our, our reality is we see this sin and brokenness around us all of the time. And one of the comments of a woman coming across the border into Poland from the Ukraine was, don't take your freedoms for granted. Don't take those blessings that we give over to God having provided uh, for granted, because freedom can be taken away. What can't be taken away is God's grace. And I want to relate this back to the Gospel reading today. Every day Jesus went back to the Mount of Olives. I, did they have a campground there? I'm not quite certain. Um, as far as I know, there, there was not much housing out there. It was an olive grove. Um, and they would go out there and sit and sleep out in the open, Jesus and his disciples. But he needed to take that time, and, and Lent is the season of taking some time out of the hecticness of the day, and for Jesus particularly, he was fully aware of what was going on behind the scenes about him. He understood that there were detractors who would not believe the truth that he taught, nor would they believe the that the miracles had been performed, or if they did, they felt that they were a danger to the powers to be in the religious community of his day because they couldn't do those things. And they were afraid of being displaced, supplanted with the presence of Christ. And that people would, would compel him forward to take over all things, which meant that the priests, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, um, would lose their place, and not just their place, but their access to abundant wealth and power in the community. And so Jesus is faced with this every day, and he, he goes every day after teaching and healing in Jerusalem. And by the way, Luke tells us that Jesus is in, is in Jerusalem a lot more than a couple of the other Gospels do. A couple of the other Gospels talk about Jesus only going to Jerusalem at the very end 
it's, it would seem that Jesus spent much, according to Luke, spent much, much more time in Jerusalem, teaching and healing. At some point, he had to get into Jerusalem so that things could proceed on the path that God had set him on. And he knew that that path was calling him to self-sacrifice. And yet, surrounded by God's grace, he didn't stop teaching in Jerusalem. He didn't stop healing people in Jerusalem. He continued with confidence on this journey to the cross, on this journey to his sacrifice on behalf of God's children, you and me and all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus knew where he was going. In our lives today, we need to understand that we're on a journey too. We're on the journey our baptisms take us on. That is the call of God to live a different kind of life, to love and honor God above all things, and to love and honor our neighbors like we love and honor ourselves. And unless we're terribly socially inept or socially ill, these things are kind of a natural course for us. We understand the things that feed us, that hold, build us up, that, that the things that we feel really good about and find comfort and peace and kindness in. And those are the things that the Ten Commandments, the last seven, talk about in how we live together. We shall, shall, shall not, I want to say shan't, boy, there's an old word. We shall not um, kill, we shall not steal, we shall not commit adultery, we shall not um, gossip, we shall, we shall not covet the things that don't belong to us, that belong to other people. All of those things are a part of this rule of God's law for our lives that still stands through baptism, but none of us can keep all of them. And we can't keep all of them all the time. Instead, Jesus tells us, I came to fulfill the law on your behalf. Because you can't do it. Only I can make you righteous with God. And so that's, in this Lenten season, we're kind of journeying through all of this stuff. And wow, I'm thinking about what's going on in the world and in our communities. And, and the fact that we have such diversity of of ideals and diversity of understanding about things between people and there are wedges going in between people and yet in the midst of that we still believe in Christ we still need to know that we are surrounded by God's grace every day just as Christ did just as he understood we saw what happened when and you know we don't really know exactly what happened with Judas there, there are things said about what may have been the cause for him to kind of step away from Christ and to go to the authorities and to be paid to report to them when they could find and where they could find Jesus when it wouldn't be in the midst of all the crowds that gathered around him every single day. And of course that happened in the garden. But in some way the sin and brokenness in Judas' life had found a hole in God's grace. One perhaps of its own creation. We could have some real long theological discussions about the necessity for Judas to do what he did. And then talk about whether or not it was an act of sin and brokenness or it was an, an act of necessity that God drove Judas to. Um, there have been lots of conversations about that, too. Was he a social activist and he wanted the money to give to the poor? That's one conversation I've heard. <laughs> you know, because obviously after all of this unfolds and takes place, at, with his being behind it, he is so troubled that he decides to end his life. Somehow, for those brief moments, he did what was necessary for Jesus to, to complete this journey to the cross. 
And Judas knew how wrong it was. But it had to happen. And God knew it had to happen. And perhaps Judas, from the very beginning, because Christ tells us he knew those disciples' hearts and minds from, the, from before the time he called them, perhaps he knew that Judas would be the one. So it tells us how easy it is for someone who, you know, I think we would like to say, man, if I was with Jesus for these three years, I would never do anything like that to him. Well, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe we would do something like that because we might come to believe or think about Christ in a way which said, man, he doesn't get it. He could have all the power and authority he wants. He could have the wealth of the world at his feet. Sounds like the temptation after Christ's baptism. And he just won't go there. He won't stop all of the pain and suffering all around the world. He won't stop the imposition of Roman rule on our country. He won't, he won't, he won't. He won't get involved in that because that's not why he came. So you see, it would be possible for sin and brokenness, even in the closest to Christ, to take over. You know, when Jesus is washing the feet, and the disciple says, oh no, not me, Lord. I'm... And Jesus says, well, hold it. If I don't do this, then you have no part of me. You're not, you're not my disciple anymore, if that's the case. We see this constantly in Scripture. The, the downfall of people because they are sinful and the necessity for Christ's advent and for God's epiphany about his son and his journey to the cross that we remember on Good Friday, it all had to happen in order for us to be in the relationship with God that he intended from the very beginning to be in with his people. So let's remember to, to remind ourselves every single day about being surrounded by God, by God's compassion and love and comfort and peace and salvation in Christ. Because this is not an easy time in our world. It's not, it's not the kind of time that we might have all hoped for in our later years to have to worry about whether or not there's going to be some kind of extraordinary world war which destroys whole portions of the of the planet but yet here we are and the only thing that holds us secure is the knowledge that christ is our lord and savior and that he never will depart from us in the name of jesus christ amen Hymn number 329, if you're using your hymnal. If you're not, it's above you on the screen.
Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we call upon you to break in to the hearts and minds of the perpetrators of war and evil in our world. We ask for your spirit to be persistent with them, to get a glimmer of light into those dark hearts and closed minds so that they might begin to see the possibility of change, the possibility of stopping, the possibility of peace. We pray for the people of the Ukraine and the people around them, the nations around them, which are now opening their borders to the several millions of people, primarily women and children, who've come out of that war-torn nation. And we pray that we might find ways, as your people, to be with them, to help them out. And in that process, we might strike that balance that seems to be so difficult to do, that we keep the peace and yet perhaps don't get involved in a global conflict again as a nation and as people. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. Gracious Lord, we, we pray for uh, members of our congregation who are still wary of coming to church because of the COVID-19 virus. And now that our communities are beginning to loosen the standards for how um, we will be uh, careful around each other, we pray that you help us to remember that there are still those who are vulnerable. There are still those people who are afraid. Um, and, and we need to always, as your children, be mindful because we're asked to love them as we love ourselves. So help us to keep that in our minds and not to let our own sense of propriety take charge uh, and, and we come to fail to care for those around us. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for your church, Lord. We have come at a juncture in the life of the church where it seems we have an entire generation of people whose lives have been impacted by social media and by gaming and by uh, endless television and by all kinds of things. Maybe a long history during their lives of our nation being at war who seem to think that the church is not a place where they need to be and certainly seems to be a place where they don't want to be. Help us to find avenues with the help of your Holy Spirit to break into the lives of this new generation of your children so that they might come to know how important it is for them to be in this relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for all who are ill who are suffering with a variety of health issues, that you might bring your wholeness of health to them, that you might guide the doctors who are working with them, and that you might give those doctors success as they treat and care for um, our brothers and sisters who need that care so desperately. Hear us, O oh God. And be with us, Lord, as we prepare to come to your holy meal. For it is here that you break into our lives once again, just as you did at baptism. And your very real presence uh, comes to us in the simple meal of wine and bread. And yet it has all the fullness of your physical presence in, with, and around us. Help us to remember that we are surrounded by your grace all of the time. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. I have to turn these pages. I think microphones are my nemesis. 
Growing up with a large voice, I hardly ever used them. Uh, we will continue now with consecrating the bread and wine at the altar and with the distribution. And Melody said she'll distribute today and you'll need to take marks back to it. Okay? On the night in which it was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.